And I, I, a, a whole lot has took has taken place by the time uh, Israel is uh, is on the scene. By the time Paul is come on comes on the scene, um, they're used to hearing that you know they got a savior and every captivity with a savior and and things like that. Um, now, but you get Paul comes on the scene. And uh, the conversation is starting to shift. It shifted before that, uh, after the ascension of, of, of Christ. Uh, then you start hearing more conversation about Gentiles and gen and these types of things uh, coming into play. Israel has had proselytes or people that were non-Israelites that became Gentile. There were Gentiles that became proselytes that converted over. And um, they began to live like Israelites. They were... Uh, viewed upon, even though there were still some limitations uh, to how they treated them. But Paul comes on the scene and he says some powerful things um, that really uh, that really was revolutionary in the sense of uh, talking about uh, the Gentile position in the kingdom. And I think that's something that's big and very important for us to look at and to examine so we can really get a kind of an understanding of what's going on with Shaul here. All right, so we're going to get into that. Let's look at the first uh, scripture. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and we're going to look at verse 19. Uh, this is kind of where we're going to hone into uh, and kind of look at this, kind of give a breakdown of understanding. But here's, here's the reading. It says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh Within it, within you, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God or Yah? You are not your own. Now, when we hear this, are y'all familiar with this passage of scripture? Have y'all heard this before? Um, and if you have, what 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 thought comes to mind when looking at uh this particular scripture or hearing? This particular scripture. Um, um, yes, I heard before several times actually. <laughs> um, and to me, when when I hear that, I think about um the presence of God being in 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 man. Not necessarily a a particular building, since we know God is a spirit. So there's you know there's no form of God that you can actually that's tangible that you can put inside yourself, except for the spirit. Right. So when we hear this, do we associate? Oftentimes, I know, um, I've heard people associate this with food, you know, and things like that. Um, I've heard people associate that with, with smoking you know, and different things of that nature uh, when it comes down to the body being a temple. But um, I think that it may be a little deeper than that when it comes down to it. I don't think it's just that simple, but also, you know, within the time in which we live, you know, a lot of people don't take that approach. A lot of people will, will isolate a scripture and base that upon whatever they're trying to um articulate to someone else in conversation or whether it's uh theological debates or or you know or whatnot they associate that uh, with that um so let's let's look at it here so let's let's go to and and see what does this mean all right because there's always when it comes down to the scriptures i think we have to make sure that we do ourselves a service to understand not just what the scriptures say, but to understand what it means. The new city was a Roman colony and its inhabitants were Romans, both veterans and freedmen. Greeks had been slow to return, but by the time Paul contact with the city, they were present in large numbers. Commercial prosperity had attracted Orientals in considerable numbers. And the city was truly cosmo cosmopolitan. Enough Jews present, present to justify a synagogue. A.M. Hunter has described the city 
as a compound of new market Chicago or Paris with perhaps a bit of port said thrown in. The exact population cannot be determined. Estimates run from 100,000 to 600,000. It was a teeming city made up of permanent residents of many nationalities. In addition, there were always present large numbers of sailors and merchants from all over the Roman Empire. The church in Corinth existed in a grossly sinful atmosphere, which continued to make its mark on the church. Many of the problems of the church found their basis in the life of the city. Perhaps the most significant of the factors which, com which comprised the atmosphere of Corinth was gross, unashamed immor immortality. Both the, the old city and the Roman colony were known far and wide for their sexual looseness. The most prominent site was the Acrocorinth, a sharp project projection which rose to a height of 1,800 feet. On the summit of this steep mountain stood the temple of Aphrodite, a symbol of the lust which, prev which pervaded the mind of the city. The worship of this goddess was not Greek in origin, but oriental. It had been imported from the Phoenician cult of Starte. In Old Corinth, the temple maintained a thousand priestess whom mounted to no more than common prostitution. It is not certain that the thousand priestess were maintained in the temple to re of rebuilt Corinth. Nevertheless, the gross immorality continued as before. Taken to the account, I would I would go dig a little deeper as well around this time during this time period to see who were and what were the true Orientals of that day. Um, it would probably shock you to find out that most of them are not what we know today as in the modern sense of Orientals. Um, and that's just for you guys' studies if you guys want to look a little deeper into that. I, I do. Um, uh, Dr. Brown, too, like this, where do you find this? Like, I want to be able to kind of keep access to reading this because I want to kind of dissect it a little bit. But uh, this is not a, this is not scripture, is it? No, no, this, this is not. Uh, these this, last two, the last two. No, these are historians. I can see, I'll send you the, uh, the link. One of them is A.M. A. Hunter. You can look okay. up Hunter's work. Uh, A.M. Hunter on Corinth uh, or the history of Corinth. So let's look at, so let's go back to verse 12. Um, we looked at 19, but let's go back to verse 12 so we can look at this. Verse 12, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. <clears throat> and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. But the, for the Lord or the Elohim and the Elohim for the body. God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. So listen to what listen to what Paul is doing. Paul is having a conversation. He's writing conversation to a con to a congregation that is mixed up. We, we see all types of people. You got Romans. You got all types of people. You got, of course, you have. 
a temple there for Israelites in the city. So this, this congregation, all of these believers are made up, but in this particular conversation, we already know that the Israelites know about keeping their body and their temple clean. That's not something he has to talk to them about. So we can look at this based on the context and say that this conversation is to is to is to non-Israelites. All right, because Israelites, the one thing that they know, they know about keeping their body clean they, and not they, doing certain things and partaking in certain things or eating certain things. Go ahead. I was going to say, what even though um Yeshua is risen, they they still would have been not eating pork no, or, they, or not no. doing anything to divide. They would still have been keeping th that part of the law. They would have been keeping that part of the law, but not on that. They also understand culturally that's not that something that's done in the culture. So we know that this is talking about people who are used to having these type of immoralities and other things that are going on, but now they are believers. So if they're believers in, in Christ as the Savior, then um, he has to have a conversation with them of the importance. Now, there's this also something that uh, Paul is doing. I was consider him a very brave individual uh, for even teaching or even writing this particular letter uh, to these, this congregation and specifically to these Gentiles. This is a very bold move, and we'll see why here in a minute, okay? Um, so let's go to the next. Verse 15, do you not know? Listen to what he's saying. So he's asking a question. Paul is asking a question. It's a question about not as though he knows that they know and they're just being disobedient. That's not what the type of question it is. It's a question that he's asking, but it's also from a place of informing. So he's saying, you don't know. He say, he say, you don't know. You don't know that your body are members of Christ. Now, now, here's the thing. Here's another thing. It wasn't common for even. It wasn't common for Israelites, even in their preaching of the gospel. It was not common for Israelites to go around talking to Gentiles about straight, straightening up and not eating certain things. It wasn't like a major common thing because they they understood that they're not Israelites. Even though the scriptures say, hey, if they keep the commandments, that they, you ought to view them as such and all that other stuff. But by the time you still had the Pharisees going around, you still had all this other stuff, people were just, it wasn't just that type of conversation uh, taking place. So Paul is writing a letter to simply inform and educate, but also to impart. That's another thing. Paul is Paul in this letter is imparting into them confidence to know who their savior is. So as believers, it's not just about just believing and accepting and confessing with your mouth. There's also a moral responsibility that has to take place. You just can't not you just can't say I believe and don't display it by your living. Um I just think that everything don't need to be sermonized. You know, I think some some sometimes you can sermonize things and and it's and everybody like to have good church and stuff like that. But I just think sometimes I, I well I would say this, I believe that a lot of their teaching in the Bible wasn't sermonized. I don't think a lot of it was put it in this vacuum to sound a certain kind of way to make people move emotionally and, and make people, you know, shout, dance and holler. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love having a good time, you know, worship and things like that. But I think that dealing with these types of, of, of letters that he's writing to them, uh, this is real life. This is not, it's not a church experience. This is real life for them. And Paul is really, speaking to the hearts of the people because he's concerned about their salvation. And that's that's the main thing that we have to really look at and understand when we start looking at the Bible. It's real life. It's something that happened uh, in, in antiquity in a time. And most of us, 
in the in our in this modern day, we're dealing with some of the things that they that they endured, that they went through, and things that they overcame, and some of the things in the scriptures that they didn't overcome that was detrimental. So yeah. I think that we have to really look at it and examine it and really understand what the most high is trying to get to us uh with these letters. But he says in verse 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from the most high? You are not your own. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So Paul is saying, look, the only way you can pay back the price that was bought, that was that was paid for you, is you have to use your body as a token of, de of debt. That the that you pay back to the Most High. Think of that. Now who does now who does that? But 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 here's here's the thing. Here's, here's what I like about what Paul is doing too. Paul is I think Elder Casey mentioned it earlier. Paul is using this surrounding understanding of prostitution. I want y'all to hear me carefully here. He says, "For you were bought with a price." So glorify the most high with your body. Think of that statement. In a in a in an environment where people use their body to make money, people use their body to uh to uh to uh satisfy lust, sin, fornication, adultery. Paul is using the same analogy. He's using an analogy, but he's not telling them to use their body for themselves or use their body to please somebody else. He said, use your body the same way you would use your body to, 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 uh, to, to glorify the flesh. Use your body to glorify the spirit. That's powerful because he's using what they understand, the language of what they, this is masterful in empowerment and evangelistic. because he's not talking over them or at them. Paul is talking to them. And they can hear his heart. And they can feel his heart. And they feel his compassion. And they feel his love for them. It's powerful. So let's go to, let's look at this. Why is this? Why? Why is that so important? Here, 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 here's another reason why it's important. Can you imagine? So Paul is making this statement. Notice Paul uses the term, the word "temple." Now everybody in this day and age understand how significant and how important the temple is. Everybody, from the Jew to the Greek to the Gentile to the barbarians, they all understand what it means. Paul uses the term temple. Your body is the temple. Now, I want y'all to look at this design this, this, that's here. Paul in his letters is writing to Gentiles. But look at what he's saying. Now, Gentiles who were believers, they only could be in certain parts of the temple. Now, on the diagram, what, what do y'all what do y'all see the Gentiles located here on the diagram? Of Man, the come on, they outnumber everybody. They got more room than everybody. <laughs> Look how small that little space Israel got. Look how space Israel is about the same size. Israel men. Young boys and men, because the women are in their own section. Yep. From the from the teenage girls on up to the to the widows are in that section. Then you got the boys that are quote for menstrual or however they call it, up to the, the, the elderly men. There's both of those combined don't compare to one side of the Gentiles court. On his front side. <laughs> That's right, Elder Casey. 
<laughs> you know but who's running the temple too. <laughs> so this the this this is this, 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 now look now look at look at look at the the women got they temp they they area of the temple right. Israel got their areas of the, of the temple. So so Israelites can go in no area of you, no matter what tribe you're from, you can go within the center. You're, the closest you can get, notice the men are the closest to the altar, right? You got the women who are closer to the men. That'll, that'll preach. <laughs> the altar is located in the center, right? The Gentiles on the outer courts. The Gentiles don't have the opportunity to see what's going on near the altar. They got to hear about it. They can't see it. They don't have the opportunity to go in the inner courts of the temple. Only the outer courts of the temple, right? Now, the altar is located at the entrance of the holy place. Now, Paul is using this phrase in his term, temple, right? He tells Gentiles who are who are who are customarily and, and, and used to only having an outer court view that their bodies is the temple. Now, when you say when you make when you start talking about temple. To a, to, a, to a second temple Israelite or Jew the temple when you start saying the presence of God is in the temple what do y'all think that are they, they're talking about say that one more time if if to a second temple Jew or Israelite if they were told that the presence of Yah or God is in the temple, what would that what would they associate that with? Your body. No, 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 no. Oh. Them. no, 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 uh-uh. Listen to what I'm saying, y'all. I'm not talking about a Gentile. I'm saying a Jew, an Israelite. That it, Messiah had returned. No, no, no. Y'all, see, you're not listening to what I'm saying. You're talking too fast. Listen. To a Israelite, when an Israelite is told that the presence of God is in the temple. I want y'all to I want y'all to understand. In the Old Testament, where was the presence of the Most High? Where did it dwell? In the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, in the temple. Okay, in the temple. Uh, what, uh, what part of the temple? In the inner court. Behind the, holy the, place. The, the holy place. Okay, yeah, the holy place. Right. So, only one time a year. Yes, sir, that the priest could go in that and the make the priest can go in the holy place. So when, so, so, when the, so, when the presence of the Most High came down or dwelled, he didn't just dwell in any part of the temple. Because this would be considered when you, if you told somebody, hey man, I'm going to the temple, and you are a you, you're not a priest, you're just an Israelite, and you're a male, people automatically gonna associate, okay, well, you're going into the the the, the the uh the inner court. You're gonna go into the, or you're gonna go into the in the inner courts. But if you're a priest and you tell them, that you're going into the temple and it's that one time a year, they know you're going into the holy place because that's what that's the holies of holies where the presence of the most high dwelt. Only the priest can go in there one time a year. The reason why I'm saying this is because Paul is telling these Gentiles that the presence where the most high dwell is in you. I want y'all to think about this. He's telling the unclean circumcised Gentile. That's why I said earlier, it took some balls and some guts to say that, to make that statement in a letter to it to be read publicly because only Israelites associate the holies of holies. You telling me an unclean Gentile that the presence of the most high that dwells in the inner course of the temple 
where only the high priest can go one time a year? The, meaning this, that the most high, his presence don't even dwell in the courts of Israel. His presence don't even dwell in the women's courts. His presence don't even dwell where the altar is. His presence dwell in the holy place. And you telling us that these unclean Gentiles, the presence don't just dwell in the temple no more that is in they body? Man, we stoning your behind. Not Ain't only no that, way. Not only that, but you don't need no high priest no more. You don't need no high Come on, man. I, I, I want y'all to, to think about how powerful that statement is. This is why when Paul finished, this is why Paul said, man, I ran my race. I kept the faith. Man, them folk got Paul letters. Now, it makes sense why Peter said what he was saying about Paul. Man, listen, that when they got a hold of them letters, they said, man, this dude here, hey, when, it, when you get the ax, no wonder Peter them say, hey, man, hey, the word going around, man, you teaching, you teach some crazy stuff. Because why? Because they understood that the presence of the Most High dwell in the inner court of the temple where only a certain people can go. So you telling me that his presence is now, you ain't, you ain't saying his presence in Israelites. You say his presence in Gentiles. I don't think y'all really understand how serious that is back in them days. 